Now we're getting into uh, topic 10, financing international transactions, and the slide 128 is courtesy of the Bank of Nova Scotia. A few years ago, we had a, uh, a representative of the bank come in and talk to us about letters of credit. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, they've uh, allowed me to use this screen in the next one, um, and this shows a risk barometer, and it talks about the most riskiest way to finance tra international transactions and the uh, safest. Um, obviously, um, the riskiest uh, one side of the uh, equation is uh, open account. So I give you the goods, uh, 30, 60, 90 days. A lot can happen in that 90 days. Uh, you could go insolvent, um, all sorts of uh, disasters, and then we don't get paid and the goods are gone. On the other side of the coin, the uh, obvious the safest way is to get cash in advance um, and then ship the goods. Uh, the problem is uh, cash in advance, um, they don't want to do that until they've gotten the goods and open an account. Um, I don't want to do that um, until they get paid. And, and so these are conflicting. In between there, there's a number of other suggested ways of financing transactions. And um, uh, really it boils down to um, the best one is irrevocable letter of credit and even super best is irrevocable confirmed letter of credit. So let's go down the list. Documentary collection means um, we send the goods and uh, we exchange the necessary documents and then you pay by a document called a bill of exchange. Well, a bill of exchange is like a check and you know checks bounce, boom, boom, boom. So obviously there's um, a potential for uh, the check to bounce or, or uh, be a fraudulent check. Okay, so it's a lot of business used to be done that way. Uh, now it's being superseded by uh, letters of credit. So there are letters of credit which are revocable. And um, I guess the big question is, uh, why would you do one of those? Okay, um, what it means is um, uh, uh, the buyer goes to his bank and says, um, I set up a letter of credit to pay for these goods once you receive the documents uh, confirming that they've been shipped. Um, well, I, I, I'm not going to say anything more uh, except that it can happen. I had a client who was selling a product from uh, British Columbia to Japan and he had got a letter of credit from the uh, Bank of Japan. He says, look, Peter, that's it's got to be as good as gold. Pardon me, eh? And I said, uh, it, it doesn't. No, it's revocable. So uh, he went back and he said, look, I want that to be irrevocable. And they went, oh, yeah, sure. OK, so um, you just have to be a little careful to make sure you review the documents. Um, a irrevocable letter of credit is one where the buyer sets up the letter of credit and then cannot get that money back, okay? Um, and once the seller sends the documents to the bank uh, that issued the letter of credit, that bank is obligated to pay, okay? They cannot say, oh, well, wait, there's fraud or some other reason why, you know, no, no. Once the documents match, they pay, um, and the buyer cannot revoke that. So that's great, except let's say I got a letter of credit from G'day Mate in Australia, and it said the uh, really solid bank of uh, West South Wales. And I go, West South Wales, like that's one of their states, really solid. Any bank that calls themselves the really solid bank, you gotta really wonder whether it's solid or not. So I'm a little worried, right? So I say to G'day mate, um, uh, I want that uh, letter of credit confirmed, please. And the, the, that bank would go to a really well-established bank like Barclays Bank or something uh, and say, would you confirm it? And what that means is it's like a personal guarantee. That bank is guaranteeing that if the little bank goes insolvent, um, uh, then uh, the uh, confirming bank will pay. So it's, it's almost as good as gold, all right? So, um, and it's almost as secure as cash in advance. The only difference is if there's um, a problem with the documents, and we'll get into that a little later on. So risk equals the buyer. Can you trust the buyer? The country, can you trust the country? And the bank, can you trust the bank, all right? Okay, there are commercial risks and political risks involved in inter international transactions and um, letters of credit resolve a lot of those problems. But let's just look at the commercial risks. Insolvency, 30, 60, 90 days transaction. If the buyer goes insolvent, you're out of luck. 
Uh, repudiation. Uh, repudiation is like avoidance, okay? The buyer refuses to accept the goods. Um, <clears throat> so um, that's what happened with the uh, Puerto, uh, Puerto Rico um, situation where the, the uh, buyer down there refused the goods. Um, <clears throat> so uh, repudiation is, is a potential problem. And then there's default. The buyer just does not pay. Um, on the due date, they may intend to pay, they may have cash problems, whatever, and it may be that eventually you do get paid, but uh, it, there's a potential that you won't get paid. Foreign currency exposure, uh, the transactional risk of receivables. <laughs> I have a personal anecdote on this one. Um, my wife and I used to go down to the Hood Canal, which is an inland water, it's not really a canal. A waterway in Washington State. The water's warm, it's clean. Um, we really enjoyed having a cottage on the canal because um, uh, we got shrimp, we got clams, we got, uh, uh, well, not so much clams, but we got oysters and, uh, and, and crab. But anyway, before we had our cottage, we used to camp down there all the time. And then eventually we thought, well, we like it so much, why don't we look at buying a cottage? We found the one we wanted to buy, and we made an offer that was accepted at the beginning of August. We said we wanted it to close at the beginning of September, not because we were in a rush because of um, potential fernsey exposure problems, but merely because we wanted to be able to use it at, you know, at, towards the end of the season. Um, <coughs> pardon me. So, um, and, and of course, the transaction is in American dollars, but we were paying in Canadian, right? We had to convert our Canadian. Between August the 1st and September the 1st, when the transaction closed and we had to pony up the money, um, the, uh, the value of the Canadian dollar dropped and the purchase cost us $7,000 more than we anticipated. So foreign currency exposure is... Risky. Documentary uh, problems. Um, this, uh, you know, some of those problems, commercial risks, can be protected by the letter of credit. You know, like the buyer going insolvent. The money's already at the bank. You get it. The buyer refuses to accept the goods. Who cares? The money's already in the bank. You get the money. Uh, the buyer defaults on payment. How can he? It's the bank that's paying. So you can protect against those. Uh, transaction risks uh, with foreign currency exposure. Uh, you know, you can you can do things like you can uh, buy American dollars at a you know uh, now for then sort of thing. Um, documentary credits, though, our documentary problems is one problem with respect to letters of credit, and that's when the documents don't match. The letter of credit may be delayed being paid out. Okay, so those are the commercial risks. Then there's political risks, war, civil dis, uh, disturbances. Okay. So wars, um, and then there's civil disturbances like riots, which are going on all over the United States right now. Um, well, we sh I should back up. Trump says there's riots going all over the states. Uh, generally, they are peaceful demonstrations, and they don't turn into riots until Trump sicks the police on them. Uh, but anyway, those things can interfere with the shipment of goods. Um, and sometimes even the transfer of funds if it's a war, okay? Foreign currency, uh, foreign exchange conversion uh, is a problem with some countries that get into financial difficulties and they don't have American dollars, okay? And so you've got this transaction going on with Australia and, and, and uh, they're paying in American dollars. No problem there. But what happens if it's a smaller country? Um, uh, and they have uh, not enough American dollars to pay out. We talked about that in uh, Russia uh, when the Soviet Union was in existence and uh, Pepsi was uh, sending over uh, soft drinks and the Soviet Union didn't have enough uh, U.S. dollars to pay and Pepsi said, we're not accepting rubles. The Soviet Union said, hey, you have to take um, vodka uh, as uh, you know, a counter trade. Um, so there, there could be those sorts of problems. Um, okay, and there could be some sort of a disagreement between the governments that uh, uh, one government just blocks the transfer of currencies. Permit problems is a definite possibility, and this can occur um, even when your industry isn't part of the dispute that's going on. Um, the, uh, a few years ago, Canada, and I think I mentioned this already, I can't remember why, but... Um, 
A few years ago, Canada was uh, upset about the China's um, toys for children because they were being painted with lead-based paint, which, of course, you know, every kid gets a toy. The first thing they do is suck on it. Um, and, um, uh, and so this is a danger. So we said we're not going to import any more uh, toys from China that have uh, been painted with lead paint um, until they change. Well, you know, China's a little bit bigger than we are, folks. And uh, so what China said was uh, we're not going to import any pork from, uh, uh, from Canada. Uh, because of mad pork disease. Well, there is no such thing as mad pork disease. Okay, they just made it up. Um, and uh, suddenly the pork producers uh, can't get export or uh, pardon me, import permits to get their pork into China because of another dispute that had nothing to do with them. So potentially there's this particular type of problem. Um, okay, now we're going to get into um, the payment. And we're going to look at uh, uh, tender of performance, and um, and then we're going to look at payment under letters of credit. I'm just going to take a short break for a moment, though, because I see my uh, laptop is low on battery, and I will plug in my battery and be right back. One of the dangers in payment is you have to do the payment exactly as required. Otherwise, it could give the other side an opportunity to back out. So you have to be ready, willing, and able to tender performance. Um, and uh, if you don't, the other side potentially can avoid the transaction. Um, <clears throat> a really simple example of what I'm talking about would be if I said, I'll sell you my car for $7,000. And you say, um, I accept. And I say, okay, I'll meet you at the uh, uh, Kaplan University parking lot at 5 o'clock on Friday. I'll have the transfer payments. You bring the money. So you turn up and um, I say, here's the transfer uh, uh, papers and you go and here's my certified check for $7,000. And I go, whoa, wait, no, 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 I'm not selling. You go, yes, you are selling because we got a deal. You know, you said you'd sell and I said I'd pay. No, I said I will, I will take $7,000, not a check. Okay, so um, uh, now... Usually that dispute wouldn't happen because I want to sell my car and a certified check is um, almost as good as gold. So, um, uh, but I could if I wanted to sell it to somebody else and I wanted to get out of this transaction because I've got somebody who wants to buy it for nine and I'd rather sell it for nine than seven. So I say to you, no, nope. I said $7,000 cash. Do you have $7,000 cash? And you go, no, I don't, but you know, too bad. Okay, you have to tender performance. Another example is in a lease situation, uh, tenants in the commercial premises have um, been caught when they give the first month's uh, pay, uh, rent and the last month's rent, and then at the beginning of uh, the second month, they, they're sitting there with their check to pay the landlord. You know, gee, you didn't come by. Two days go by, gee, you didn't come by. Three days go by, gee, you didn't come by. Four days you come in and, in, and bingo, a lock's put on the door and you're evicted for non-payment of rent, you go, no, 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 I, I was ready, willing, and able at all times to pay. But a lease contract doesn't say you just have to be ready, willing, and able. It says you have to tender performance to the landlord at a specific place. So it's your job to seek out the landlord and pay. Okay, and they actually, um, the uh, landlord was able to forfeit, get a forfeiture of lease and take over the premises along with the leasehold improvements that had been done by the tenant before they moved in. So you have to be ready, willing, and able at all times to tender performance. Um, in a transaction, uh, a <clears throat> good day mate um, would, uh, would, might be able to get out of the transaction if, um, uh, if they were going to pay and um, uh, the skis didn't come, um, they uh, they couldn't. If the date was important, they could instruct the, uh, the the bank not to pay out on the letters of credit. But no, no, that doesn't work actually, because the only way that works is on, on the <clears throat> not on the delivery of skis, but documents. So forget that last part. Anyway, um, you have to be ready, willing, at all times to tender performance. Um, under a letter of credit, um, the, um, it's an instrument issued by a bank at the request of the buyer obligating the bank to pay the seller with a certain period of time upon the, pre 
uh, presentation of the documents specified by the buyer. Um, and then there's some types of letters of credit, which I'm going to come back and talk about in a minute. But first of all, I want to uh, uh, I want to deal with the, uh, the, how the how the transaction works. So I have this wonderful little diagram, which has turned up on exams in the past. It shows the beneficiary, who is the seller, is sending goods to the account party, who is the buyer. Uh, so beneficiary would be peak performance pontoons. Uh, the account party would be um, uh, G'day Mate in Australia. They're called the account party because they set up an account with their issuing bank. Okay, the issuing bank would be the uh, uh, Bank of New South Wales, I think is that. That was in the um, uh, the quote that Peak Performance Pontoons received. So that's the issuing bank. And the issuing bank would then send the documents to the um, beneficiary's um, advising bank. Now, um, in that quote, um, it said... Um, uh, con uh, something about it, um, name advising bank. Okay, so in other words, uh, G'day makes sense this offer, this little quote, uh, sends the offer and they say, uh, we want to buy, here's our bank, we'll set up a, uh, a letter of credit, uh, but they don't know what bank we deal with, so they asked to be told who the advising bank was. Peak Performance Pontoons, when they accept the offer, would say advising bank, Bank of Nova Scotia. So the issuing bank sends the letter of credit to the Bank of Nova Scotia. The Bank of Nova Scotia gets it. Why are they called the advising bank? Because once they get it, they have to advise peak performance pontoons. Hey, we have a letter of credit. Um, so you can really kind of figure figure out who's who. Now, um, in that quote, uh, G'day Mate has already considered that um, the... Uh, their, their bank is small, and so Peak Performance Pontoons would probably want a confirming bank. So in the quote, they said confirming bank, Barclays Bank. So they would be the confirming bank that's guaranteeing payment. Now, that transaction occurs once Peak Performance Pontoons delivers the documents to the issuing bank. Now, the, the buyer says, okay, we're buying this. There's going to be these five documents, okay? The issuing bank, once they receive those five documents from Peak Performance Pontoons, is obligated to pay out. <clears throat> now, why why do they have to receive them from Peak Performance Pontoons? Because the advising bank will say, we want Peak Performance Pontoons to have cargo insurance. We want a certificate of origin. The buyer cannot give those to the issuing bank. The buyer can say, those are the ones we want. Only peak performance pontoons can give those. So if they get a, a, a certificate of origin, yep, taken care of. They get an insurance statement, yep, taken care of. They get an inspection certificate, yep, taken care of. They get a bill of lading, wait, 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 wait. Uh, the bill of lading says um, uh, they're buying 1,000 skis, but the bill of lading was issued because, uh, and there's only uh, 900 and 95 because five are damaged at the dock. Well, hey, wait, whoa, 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 these don't match. We're not paying out, okay? And we'll get into that in a few moments. But if the documents Peak Performance Pontoon sends to the issuing bank match perfectly, perfectly, then the issuing bank has to pay out. Um, the documents that might be included uh, are listed on uh, slide 133, and there's six here. Um, only five would would be applicable to uh, peak performance pontoon sale. Uh, we have to have a certificate of origin that they're Canadian goods, um, and that's because, for example, uh, under the U.S. Um, Mexico Canada agreement, um, we can have duty free uh, goods going into the United States. Well, some country that wants to get the United States market but has to pay tariffs. Um, could then sell it to Canada, and Canada could then sell it to the United States and, and circumvent the, uh, the those particular barriers. Um, well, if we we would not be able to give them a certificate of origin saying that they were Canadian goods, we'd have to say they were Iranian goods or um, uh, North uh, Korean goods, and uh, and so then the transaction would be blocked. Okay, so there's a certificate of origin now. The export license or health inspection certificate 
our <clears throat> health inspection certificate is what um, um, China wants. They go, hey, we want a health inspection certificate saying that your pork is is not uh, mad, infected with mad pork disease. There is no mad pork disease, by the way. Um, China just made that up. <laughs> anyway, um, you have a health inspection certificate saying, yeah, everything's fine. Okay. Um, or an ex and, and of course, that wouldn't apply to peak performance pontoons. <clears throat> um, but um, an export certificate might be required. Mm. Maybe there would be um, because in the ski is the gyroscope. Uh, and because there's military applications, the Canadian government might say we don't want those gyroscopes being exported to um, uh, China. Uh, no, probably, it would probably not. I'm just thinking this through because um, there's already a patent, which is a public document, showing what the, what the gyroscope is like. So China already knows about it. They could, they could copy it if they wanted to from the patent <clears throat> so there's no export certificate required okay um, so that that is one document that wouldn't be required in our transaction but a certificate of inspection maybe and then the question becomes who pays um, because the bank pays out of the documents match. If peak performance pontoons was wanted to perpetrate a fraud, what they could do is they could get a container full of bricks and straw, uh, take it down to the dock, get a bill of lading saying a container containing 1,000 pairs of skis, and it would be shipped. And the documents delivered to the uh, bank, and the bank goes, yep, okay, everything matches, and they pay out. And then G'day Mate finds out they've got a box full of, uh, a container full of straws and bricks. Um, the uh, They would be out of luck, okay, because the payment has already been made. Then they have to sue Peak Performance Pontoons, and it becomes really difficult proving who put the bricks and straw in there. So they don't want that, okay. So they say, we want a certificate of inspection, which means a freight forwarder will have an agent go down and watch the thousand pairs of skis being put into the container, check to make sure, yes, it was uh, uh, 100 um, uh, cruise missiles, uh, 300 um, of the intermediate skis, and the balance were uh, beginner skis. And, uh, it, it, you know, the bill of lading is signed, the container is closed, a seal is put on it, the inspection certificate gets sent to... Uh, a good aim eight, and then they're confident that the container, when it left, um, was not uh, uh, full of straw and brick. The problem, you know, with that is who pays for that inspection, right? And <clears throat> if good aim eight wants it, um, generally uh, peak performance pontoons would say you pay. Um, sometimes. Um, the, the requirement, the purchase and sale agreement says that the buyer, or pardon me, the seller has to provide a inspection certificate and then it would be at the cost of peak performance pontoons. Commercial invoice is just the purchase and sale agreement. Um, and then a bill of lading is the, um, you know, we'll get into bills of lading in the, uh, when we get into transportation, but it's the document that indicates that the goods have been shipped and that there, weren't, there wasn't any damage caused in the, in the loading. And then the marine insurance policy would be a cargo policy, okay? Uh, marine insurance covers uh, ships, uh, all the loading equipment in the docks and uh, cargo. Uh, <clears throat> and so uh, uh, we don't want to get a marine certificate, um, or pardon me, a marine insurance policy covering the ship. That's the owner of the ship's problem. We don't certainly don't want one covering the dock loading and unloading equipment. So we would just get a cargo policy, which is a subcategory of the marine insurance policy. Okay, and then the marine insurance policy is in place. Question is who pays for it? We'll get into that when we talk about trade terms. Um, but those would be the five documents. Okay, the certificate of origin, certificate of inspection, commercial invoice, bill of lading, and the insurance policy. Those documents get sent. In return, payment is made, and everybody's happy. Um, we're going to come back to the rule of strict compliance in a minute, but let's just go back and look at the various types of um, 
Letters of credit. There's revocable kind. Forget about it. Um, you never use one of those. There's irrevocable. Uh, th those are the ones. Now, if you, if it is a document issued under the International Chamber of Commerce UCP 600 rules, then it is automatically irrevocable. If it's not a UPC 600, UCP 600, um, then uh, then it could be revocable and you want to read the document and make sure that it is irrevocable. Then it could be irrevocable confirmed, which is the situation with G'day Mate. Now it could be negotiable. Um, <clears throat> by this, um, what it means is um, <clears throat> the letter of credit is received by Peak Performance Pontoons and they could either cash it or they could negotiate with the bank that they want money in advance and then the bank gets it. So it's like a negotiable instrument. Back-to-back um, -back letters of credit. Um, if Peak Performance Pontoons was selling the goods to um, G'day Mate um, and G'day Mate was selling the goods to somebody else, um, there could be two letters of credit or you could get a back-to-back -back letter of credit. Okay, where the letter of credit that G'day Mate gets covers both the payment to um, uh, uh, Peak Performance Pontoons and the payment from this other company to them, back to back. Transferable, um, G'day Mate, um, let's say Peak Performance Pontoons is selling to numerous distributors. And um, so they have a number of these and then Peak Performance Pontoons Inc. wants to sell the business to somebody else. So the the inventory and, and everything is being sold, but not the corporation, okay? Um, so the person buying all the inventory and, and equipment and, and things wants the letters of credit um, uh, because uh, uh, that's part of the transaction. Well, we'll be able to transfer those letters of credit to the purchasing company. Or if Peak Performance Pontoons did a, um, a corporate reorganization where they wanted a holding company in a and an operating company and they wanted the holding company to receive the payments but the uh, operating company was in existence and was slated to receive the payments then the operating company could transfer them. Revolving line of credit? This is what um, G'day Mate would get because hopefully as a distributor they're not going to buy a hundred pairs of skis and then we'll never hear from them again. Hopefully they'll buy a hundred pairs this month, uh, 500 next month, a thousand the month after that, then they want 900, then they want a thousand, then they want 2,000. And so are they going to get a letter of credit for each one of those transactions? No, they're not. They're going to get a revolving letter of credit, like a revolving line of credit. Um, they, they, they satisfy the bank somehow, um, and that's between them, but the letter of credit will cover a series of transactions. A clean letter of credit um, is a, uh, <clears throat> somebody wants to pay by bills of exchange. Um, for some reason, they find it's a better way of keeping track of transactions or something. And, but I don't want to receive a bill of exchange, a check, because it might bounce. Well, that company can get a letter of credit, which is like a guarantee that the bill of exchange will be honored. So the bill of exchange turns out to uh, um, bounce because there's no money in the bank. Well, uh, the letter, because they're paying out of a different bank, the letter of credit will cover that. And then standby letter of credit um, could be used in international transactions. But the best example that I know of this is um, landlords. Um, when you lease premises, and we're talking commercial premises, you have to pay the first month's rent and then the last month's rent. Well, you don't know when the last month is going to be. So if it's uh, $12,000 a month, you pay the first month's rent, no problem. Uh, but then you give them $12,000 and they have to put that into a bank account. Um, and then they have to um, uh, figure out how much interest they're making on it because the interest may go back to the, let, uh, to the tenant or it may be applied as part of the last month's rent. Well, they might make... Uh, uh, $40,000 in interest over a number of years and then the last month's rent, well, they're holding way too much money and so money has to go back to the, um, uh, to the tenant because it's, you know, money on that, uh, on that account that's been generated. Um, well, they don't want that because that's a lot of, um, I mean, if you have 
uh, where this happened was at the um, Abbotsford International Airport where they have hangars that are leased out and they get this last month's rent from all these people. Well, there's, you know, 30 or 40 of these and it's hard to keep track of them. So they just say, okay, get a standby letter of credit uh, to pay for the last month's rent. So the last month's rent, you know, it's going to be $12,000. So you get a letter of credit for $12,000. The money just is available, but it's not generating interest. And so there's no problems. Okay. So those those are the different types of letters of credit. Now the um, the last uh, screen under letters of credit. Now is there another one? Oh no, uh, is um, uh, there must be another screen. Yeah, there is. Okay. Um, the next uh, screen is one thirty four, and um, here's some talk uh, some terms that's you know good for the exam. <laughs> one of them is de minimis non curat lex. Okay, I'm selling you a thousand pairs of skis, and because of problems, only nine thousand, or pardon me, nine hundred and ninety-seven are delivered. Oh, okay, you are canceling the contract because you didn't uh, give us a thousand. Uh, the courts will say no, you can't. All right, why? De minimis non curat lex. The law does not concern itself with trifles. Well. Um, it's a condition of the contract that you deliver by a certain time period um, and that they be of merchantable quality. Okay. Um, but it's only a warranty that you're going to get a thousand. Okay. You might only get 997. And that is a warranty which allows you to make adjustments in the price. We're not going to pay you for a thousand. We're only going to pay you for 997 or uh, we'll pay you for a thousand this time, but you have to deliver one thousand three next time. You can make some sort of an allowance. <coughs> you may have to sue, but you can only sue for breach of a warranty. You cannot sue and have the contract set aside because it's just not a condition of the contract. So a condition of a contract is a term which allows the contract to be set aside if it's breached. And a warranty of a term, uh, <clears throat> a term of a contract that is a warranty, is one the breach of which allows the uh, aggrieved party to uh, sue for damages only. All right. Difference with letters of credit. A letter of credit, the documents have to match perfectly. If they match perfectly, the bank is obligated to pay out. Um, but there's a, a rule of strict compliance, which means the documents have to match perfectly um, or the bank should not pay out. Okay. There have been letters of credit that have been held up because um, it's, uh, there was a type of uh, product, I can't remember whether it was a, a spice or whether it was nuts, um, but so Soran, uh, it was supposed to say Soran, but it said Sofan. It was a typo. Mm, we're not paying out. Um, well, everybody knows that it was intended to be Soran, but the bank cannot pay out. If they do pay out, that's when they could be liable. If the documents match and they pay out and there's a problem because of fraud or quality or whatever, not the bank's problem, okay? The buyer has to sue. Um, there was another one where the postal code was wrong. The bank refused to pay out, okay? <laughs> Postal code for crying out loud. And then there was one where 4,997 bags were delivered instead of 5,000 bags. Hey, the documents don't match. They don't pay out. Well, <clears throat> um, that would be de minimis non curat lex, but de minimis non curat lex does not apply to letters of credit. And then the last one, uh, fraud. The bank acts on documents alone. Okay, so if a fraud is perpetrated and the buyer says, hey, they've perpetrated a fraud on us, the bank says, your problem, not ours. We're obligated to pay out. If we don't pay out, we are going to be liable. Okay. All right. So that's uh, de minimis non curat lax. Just making a different uh, change to the slide. Then I have a slide in here, which I am going to delete because it's got nothing on it. Um, and then the next slide is a risk management consideration. Okay. Um, with respect to letters of credit, the first thing you do is check the letter of credit and make sure it says UCP 600 or irrevocable. Okay. 
The second thing you do is check the status of the issuing bank. The really solid bank of Lower Lonsdale, eh, you know, the People's Bank in Washington State, eh, you know, you don't know these banks and so they may or may not be solvent. Um, if uh, you don't know the bank, then you ask for a confirming bank. Okay, so check the LC says ir irrevocable or UCP 600. Check the status of the issuing bank. Get a confirming bank. Um, and you don't always want to get a confirming bank. Okay, if you have confidence in the uh, in the buyer's bank, getting a, conf a, a confirming bank is just an added cost to the buyer, and the buyer might bank out, bank out, bat, bank out of the deal, back out of the deal. Um, okay. Um, uh, as soon as the letter of credit is delivered to the beneficiary for advisement, in other words, the advising bank says, here's the letter of credit, the beneficiary should verify the terms to make sure that the documents reflect the deal, because otherwise your documents that you send to the bank will not match and there'll be a delay in paying out. Okay. Uh, and then finally, check the documents um, to be sent to the issuing bank at the time they're being sent to make sure that they do match. Okay, so the, those those factors, um, risk management, very 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 important. Now the uh, slide uh, one thirty eight just uh, gives the definitions of advising bank, confirming bank, issuing bank, and beneficiary. We've already gone through those, but they are actually um, defined in the UCP six hundred. Okay, and those are the definitions. Uh, and that is uh, bingo bango bong. That's the um, uh, financing uh, transactions, international transactions. Um, okay, and I'm just going to upload this and we'll get on to um, the next um, group of material, which is uh, uh, trade terms.